Mrs. Funny unlocked the hall door, climbed the damp steps and struck a match. The windows were permanently blacked out and the air smelt of gas and tea meetings. There was an hour to spare before the communal brethren came in, but Mrs. Funny, who was the hall caretaker, did not believe in wasting time. After lighting the wheezing mantles and the gas fire, she went into the kitchen, filled the urn, and came back with a duster which had once been Mr. Funny's singlet. She was a careful worker. She dusted the forms all over, reading the inscriptions on the back. Some in scarlet cried, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Others, in sickly blue, said that God was love, and were contradicted by faded yellow texts insisting that he was a jealous God. At first Mrs. Funny had laughed at these crude ejaculations. Now they disturbed her. Not being a converted member of the communal brethren, she was under no obligation to believe, but now and again she found herself wondering if there wasn't something in it. She had got the caretaker's job through her husband, who was a leading light at meetings, and as he'd been out of work for most of his married life, she could not afford to turn down the money. It gave her something to do, Mr Funny said, and his wife, a little bitterly perhaps, agreed. Her evenings had drifted into one long night of prayers and buns and pennies for the gas, and her afternoons into long, dull sessions of cleaning up. Five minutes before the earliest comer could be expected, she had finished her work and retired to the kitchen. From there she could hear old Jenny Mowbray panting up the stair, trailing her reluctant granddaughter, who would have preferred to be at home playing peaver on the stairhead. Mr Farrell the coalman came next, sitting down humbly, and then the rest arrived in twos and threes. Mr Funny alone, as husband of the caretaker, strolled into the kitchen, fingered the halfpenny buns and strolled out again. From the way in which he kept turning over the money in his pockets, Mrs Funny guessed that he had something on his mind. Perhaps he was going to speak. Mrs Funny often wondered if the urge would ever come upon her. She hoped not. Outside, Glasgow dripped and drizzled. The communal brethren had turned out in old coats and waterproofs, and half the forms were filled with sad, wet people looking over hymn books and talking in whispers. Every time the door opened, a fog came in from the river and an acrid, kippery smell from the fish curers in Thistle Street. Mrs Funny wondered what brought people out to these meetings. For herself, she would have given anything to be in her own house, able to spend the evening as she liked. But apart from the money, there was her husband. He would not hear of her giving up the brethren. Well, much as she hated his fanaticism, it was better than having a man who drank or gambled or hung around the corners with the beehive gang. There was no set programme for the meeting, as many as could joined in with impromptu prayers, sermons and solos. Funny did so, frequently, and oh, Jack Garrity could be relied on to keep things going. Every man had his own special theme. Jack Garrity's was preparedness. He was going to talk tonight. After the first hymn, he mounted onto the little platform beside the harmonium. Mrs Funny looked around, hoping to see some job to be done. She did not want to hear that throaty voice give warning of her doom. She laughed at it, but it frightened her. They never gave this sort of sermon in church, but who was to know that the church was not purposely blinding people to their fate? Mr Garrity said it was anyway, and he seemed pretty sure of himself. There was nothing to be done. Mrs Funny tiptoed into the back form. Behold, I was shapen in wickedness, and watched Miss Mellis furtively pumping air into the harmonium. Jack Garrity made several important-looking notes, shifted the Bible on the table, looked to heaven, and cleared his throat. The audience settled down more comfortably in a smell of damp clothes and soap. They liked Jack Garrity's sermons. According to Mr Garrity, the Lord might come at any time, therefore you must be prepared. Not to be prepared 
was the worst sin possible. And as God presumably watched like a cat at a mouse hole, ready for the unwary, it was your own fault if you were caught out. Being a sporting man, Mr Garrity made the whole thing into a ghastly celestial game. Thus, if the Lord came for you and you were engaged in prayer, you scored three points. If you were working, two. If doing nothing definitely wrong, one. And if frankly engaged in sin, oh, Mr Garrity's rather coarse mind painted scarlet pictures of the future. He urged the communal brethren to prepare for the terrible advent, it might come any time now, by all sorts of inconvenient tests. They had to stop at odd moments of the day and night and calculate the amount of points they deserved. Mrs Funny, trying this out by way of a joke, was depressed to learn that she averaged very few. She had never yet been engaged in prayer and quite often her acts had been definitely carnal eating or drinking or having a nice sit down before washing up the dinner dishes. Friends, Jack Garrity roared, mopping his brow with a grey coloured handkerchief. Think on all you've done since you got up this morning. Now, take breakfast, for example. Aye, <laughs> like enough you ate your breakfast and read the paper. And what did you read, huh? What was it caught your eye on the headlines? War, battle, meat ration at one and two. And none of you thought about the blessed news waiting in the Bible, calling out to be read by every one of you. Ah, my friends, you may talk about bombs. You may talk about planes. You may talk about invasion. But what good will that do you when the Lord cometh? Behold, saith the Lord, I come not with tanks, but with judgment. And God help you all said Mr Garrity, piously, if he finds you playing darts at the warden's post instead of preparing to meet your end. Oh, this was popular stuff. When the speaker sat down and buried his nose somewhere about Nehemiah, the audience wriggled in morbid approval. Mrs Funny, slipping out to see to the urn, was glad it would soon be time to hand round the buns. She filled the tea bag, left it in the boiling water to infuse, and heard the rumble and shuffle which showed that the communal brethren were ready for refreshment. Mr Garrity, when he dropped his prophetic manner, was an insignificant, bald-headed man with broken teeth. Rather repulsive, Mrs Funny thought, but quite a rogue in his own way. Sometimes he brought his cup to the back of the hall and carried on a conversation with the caretaker. Mrs Funny did not like his jokes, she was a big, broad woman, very clean in her print overall, and Garrity, being no chicken, liked to pass the time of day with her, as he called it. Tonight, Mr Garrity was otherwise engaged. Mr Funny came into the kitchen and fingered the buns again. His wife watched him in nervous disapproval. His hands weren't very clean. Hers were wrinkled and pink with too much scrubbing. Going to speak tonight, Will? she asked. No. His face was dour and angry. How no? Och, yon Garrity's no finished yet. The spirits moved him to convert somebody the nicht, and he'll go on till he does it. Well, what about you? Can you no tell him the spirit says you've to get your spoke in as well as him? Mr Funny looked pious. No, if Garrity feels the call, he must obey. Then Mrs Funny said a dreadful thing. Oh, I bet the spirit doesn't move on here, you. You all just like to show off. She waited for an angry rebuke, but it did not come. Instead, her husband bowed his head. She saw his lips move, praying for her. Let her see thy blinding light and thy fire of judgment, O Lord. Oh, if you don't stop that daft carry on, well funny she threatened. I'll finish up here once and for all. Now mind, I'm telling you, you'll no convert me. Here, give me a hand with thee cups. The communal brethren ate slowly, making a meal of every mouthful. At home, no doubt, they gorged and guzzled and crammed their mouths too full, but here the buns were small and inadequate to fill hungry stomachs. Mrs Funny, sipping at the hall door, 
felt hatred of the bent backs, hunched shoulders and nodding heads. When she gathered in the cups, she snatched some of them from old fingers which clutched too tightly. They had a hymn next, each verse ending on an unnecessary and lugubrious Alleluia. Then Garrity got up to speak, still sucking crumbs out of his teeth. There was no warning sounded in Glasgow that night. Glasgow officially was not raided. Only one plane, isolated and pursued, went over, so high that none heard the broken beat-beat of its German accent. It dropped its cargo before it reached the city, and reserved, for no reason at all, a single incendiary for the drab dock area. Jack Garrity was doing well. The communal brethren liked powerful speakers, and Jack was laying off, pounding the Bible and perspiring. Friends, prepare yourselves, he rasped. Death comes to us all, and when the time cometh, ah, what then? Then you will not bother with the social side of death. It matters not that the cooperative bury you deeper and cheaper than Boone and McQuarrell. Dividend and brass handles will avail you nothing when you go before the Lord, and the recording angel reads out of the book, and the Lord shall consign you to hell, to burn and burn it. Eternally, eternal judgment, eternal fire, the fire of... The room was full of smoke and glare. Two of the gas mantles were hanging raggedly. There was plaster everywhere and a form had caught a light. Mrs. Funny, dazed and uplifted, saw Garrity dash for the door, followed by a frantic crowd of brethren. She believed. Oh, now she believed. She heard herself shouting, Glory, hallelujah, the fire of the Lord, before Mr. Funny grabbed her arm and dragged her clattering down the damp, worn steps into the street. It took the firemen two hours to put out the blaze, and the communal brethren, had they not run so quickly, might have heard some pointed remarks from the NFS about people who neglected to keep sand, water and a stirrup pump handy. Mrs Funny, of course, lost her job with the hall, but when her husband was called up a few weeks later to do some irksome tasks with the Pioneer Corps, she applied for war work. She now spends her days in a works canteen, washing dishes, sweeping up crumbs and presiding over the urn. The girls like her well enough. Old Funny Face, they call her, affectionately, and listen with suppressed giggles when she tries to convert them. She belongs to some queer religious sect. Harmless enough, probably, but rather mad. For example, there was that time she was fire-watching with Minor Graham. An incendiary dropped just at the door, and Mrs Funny stood shouting, Let it burn, let it burn, it is the Lord! If it hadn't been for old Garrity, the foreman, she might have heard more about it.